Hi, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. We release a new episode every Sunday morning. Today, my guest is Zeke Fo, author of the new bestseller, Number Go Up, Inside Crypto's Wild Rise and Staggering Fall. Of all the books and scholarly articles and news stories and blog posts and legal complaints, and you get the idea, that I have read on crypto, Number Go Up is truly the first one to pull everything together for me in one place. And that result is something immensely entertaining and informative. And let me be clear, this is not a condemnation of those other works, which I've chosen to read and learn so much from. Instead, it's an expression of high praise for what Zeke Fo has accomplished here. If name dropping is helpful for you in judging the strength of a book, then let me throw out only a few of those who have heaped praise on number go up. Evan Osnos, National Book Award winning author of Age of Ambition said, this book is ludicrously compelling. I quite literally couldn't put it down and I don't even care about crypto. Matt Levine, the Money Stuff columnist said, this book is what happens when the funniest financial journalist in America takes on the funniest story in modern finance. The results are as darkly hilarious as you could hope for. And Bethany McLean, author of The Smartest Guys in the Room, that was made into a brilliant documentary, said, essential reading for anyone who wants to understand the mass delusion that was crypto. Okay, let's dive in. Hey, Zeke. Hi, Jen. So uh, what's going on with your life? So I'm speaking to you live from my mom's house, and I'm here in Somerville, Massachusetts. I've come for a reading at my hometown bookstore, Porter Square Books in Cambridge. So pretty excited. Oh, my goodness. I know that. And so where, like, I actually lived in Somerville uh, on Washington Street or Washington Avenue. Where do, is that? Do you know where that is? Or no? I don't. I'm in uh, I'm in Davis Square. Okay. Well, Davis Square, is it, isn't that like, isn't Davis Square part of Cambridge, not Somerville? No, it's Somerville. I mean, you would know. I mean, look at me. See, I'm <laughs> fact checking you in real time. Anyway, so are you, that's really cool. What time is your, your book thing at uh, in Porter Square? Seven, I think. You think? Okay, I hope you show up on time. I by the should time know. This, like, this will have already happened um, by the time uh, people are hearing this. And so I guess either you showed up or you went to the wrong place at the wrong time or something. So I hope, I hope it works out well for you. Um, is it, so how many, well, how has this been going, the sort of book tour thing? So Number Go Up is my first book and the response has been so much greater than, than I expected. Um, a few weeks ago, I had already decided like, you know what, so much great stuff has happened from this book that like, it's a victory. And then I keep getting nice notes from readers I had um, a crypto guy wrote to me the other day and said, I love the way that you make fun of us. I hope that you stay in this space so that we need someone like you to be teasing us. Um, so the book Wait, is pretty. I mean, really? A crypto yes, person, gotten... even though you've called this whole thing a big Ponzi scheme, they want you to stay in this space? That's weird. Yeah. How does they, that work? You know what? They're They're not all dummies and some of them can see that a lot of the biggest players in crypto in the last two years have been total clouds. I mean, the gist of the book is I spent two years going down at the crypto rabbit hole. And I spent time with some of the biggest players and I was trying to figure out just like what is with this crypto thing? Why are all these coins going up and up? And what I concluded was that, yeah, like a huge part of it is a scam. And that, and it's not, it's not even like a great leap to say that because so many of the big players that I spent time with are now bankrupt on trial for fraud, facing, you know, civil lawsuits. So 
Uh, anyone who's been there for the last couple of years and is being honest about it would admit that it's a total disaster. So um, I, I'm someone who loves a total disaster if it involves fraud and money and ego. Um, what drew you uh, drew you to this this topic? I mean, I know that you 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 talk um, a lot about that in the book, but even before you pitched this book to your editor, what what drew you to financial shenanigans? Do you think? So when I started out as a reporter. I was supposed to cover kind of the more boring, uptight side of finance. I'd write stories about bonds, interest rates. I mean, it was terrible. You know, we'd have to write about triple B benchmark rates go up by the most since last Thursday. And go up. I'm sorry. You said, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You said go up by what? The most since last Thursday. The most um, sense. That would be, oh, I thought. I'm sorry. I thought you said the most sense, and I was like, no, it'd be basis points. But you, you said, uh, you said the most sense. Okay, gosh, that's a pretty dry topic. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah. So, meanwhile, um, yeah, you know, I, I grew up. I loved um, movies and books about uh, exciting financial things. Like when I was a teenager, my uncle gave me a copy of the book "Bringing Down the House." by Ben mm-hmm. Mesrich about the MIT mm-hmm. blackjack team. and I love you know, that set, movie. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Set right in uh, Cambridge, so like down the street from me, about these kids who came up with these this way to like beat the casino. And at first, I couldn't believe it was a true story. I ripped through it. And I don't know that I set out to be – I never really imagined that I could write like a book like that one day. But I – had this ambition to tell exciting stories. So in Wall Street, I gravitated towards the shadier characters. And I met, um, it turns out that in New York, the financial district, you got the stock exchange there, the New York Stock Exchange, which has become sort of like a big TV set. And then like not real, no real activity takes place there. Then the big financial firms, well, yeah. And all the big banks are in Midtown and Wall Street has become actually a hub for totally shady characters. And I did a story about this one boiler room across from the stock exchange. And I met all these funny guys from Staten Island or Queens. Can you, one sec, can you back up? Can you back up? Because I know what a boiler room is, but can you talk about what you mean by a boiler room? So this was a... These are stockbrokers like in the Wolf of Wall Street where there's a big room full of them and they're calling people, calling strangers all day long and saying, hey, I've got a hot tip for you. And if they find someone who will take their advice, they'll rip them off as hard as they can. What are they? Can you be more? Wait, wait, wait. Can you be more clear? If A tip for what? So you call me. I say, hi, um, what are you trying to get me to? I'm sorry. You're trying to get money out of me to buy what? What am I buying? Yeah. So I would say. Uh, listen, you know, you don't know me, but um, I'm sitting here right across from New York Stock Exchange. I work at, you know, Walter Scott Financial. And today we have got a special biotech stock that's poised to triple, we think. And we're trying to find new clients who might be interested in such a thing. You know, could I interest you in You've made my list of, you know, potential investors. Could I interest you in, say, $100,000 of this hot new stock? And is that a pump and – is it typically a pump and dump scheme or is it a new issuance or what's the usual thing that's going on, do you think? So sometimes they will just pitch sort of regular stocks, but they charge high fees and they encourage people to trade a lot. And so they'll take their money that way. Okay, so sometimes it's just churning people. Okay, got it. Uh huh. Yeah. Sometimes the biotech company itself is a pump and dump, and the people who control that company have bribed stockbrokers to pitch it to their clients. So that would be that would be a crime. And then sometimes. Well, wait, wait, wait. You say bribe. So they've paid them undisclosed commissions to 
encourage people to drive the stock price up on the secondary market for what purpose? What's in it for, if it's not a stock issuance, what's in it for the insiders to get that stock pumped up? Are they going to sell their shares once it's high or is that the idea or? Yes. Or, um, or yeah, or maybe it is uh, the shares that they're selling are coming from insiders. They've been parked yeah. somewhere like under a different name. Um, but sometimes the brokerage firm itself, its owners also control the stock in some undisclosed way. But got it. This is like a terrible business now. It's like a relic of the '90s, and <laughs> it's become. Because, like, if someone called you with this pitch, like, you'd never, you'd be like, oh, I have the internet. I don't just talk to strangers about my inve- investing ideas. You make such a good point because in the 80s, like, it was really hard even to get, like, even in the early 90s when I was working at a corporate law firm, it was, um, if you wanted to get a company's 10K or 10Q, you actually had to get, like, you had actually had to order it from the printer. You couldn't even get, there wasn't even a website. The SEC didn't even have a website, I mean, obviously. So, right. So you did rely more on brokers to even give you information if you were so inclined. That's interesting. Okay. So it's a stupid business model. So and you yeah, wrote that, about a boiler room? Yeah. So now go back. Now that you've told us what a boiler room is, tell, tell me, can you so, dive into your your, research, your uh, investigation? I just, I love this subculture. And yeah. I got to know different guys who are in this business and related businesses. And they would take me around the financial district and we'd go see their friends, their enemies. They'd uh, uh, even like the shoe shine guys would know whose boiler room was like up and whose was down. And there was one, one crooked broker. He had another one, an enemy who would always hang out outside 40 Wall Street, the Trump building. This guy mm-hmm. was called the platypus because he had this splay footed waddle. And we were just standing outside 40 Wall Street. And he said, let's just wait around for a while. The platypus will come out. And sure enough, after like 20 minutes, out waddled the platypus, smoked a cigarette, really grossly checked out a woman walking by and then threw the empty pack on the floor uh, on the street. And I thought, I don't know, I want to get into this weird culture of washed up stockbrokers and write about it. And I did a story about 40 Wall Street itself, which was full of scams, like at different Uh time. It's like a low rent building. So there Uh are all sorts of different scams going on right in that one tower, right when um, at the time when Trump was running for president. Um, That's like a like really insane kind of death of a salesman. Like it's just really wild what you're describing. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, really sad. One guy who I met, he, when times were good, you know, you could make 10 grand in a month. You know, you have a good month selling some stupid stocks and, you know, that's good money for a young guy, but he'd gotten um, hooked on pain pills and then um, started robbing pharmacies wearing like Halloween costumes. And then at the time wait, when I wait, met, how did you find this out? He told you or? I think I read about it in like a local newspaper. Maybe somebody tipped me off to it. And I thought, I want to, this guy might have some good stories from his boiler room days. Sure. And, um, and he did. Yeah. And it, so it turned out like these weird guys love to talk about work, had tons of stories about other weird guys. And one thing would lead to another. And I'd get all these stories about, kind of semi-legal loan sharks or offshore payday lending. Um, and it all kind of grew from this financial, shady financial district community. I don't want to get too far afield, because, but there is something you just said that I can't pass up. Offshore payday lending. Speak to me. What the heck is that? So one of these dudes that I'm talking about, I actually had written um, about him. I thought that we would be, he might be mad at me about it, but then he was like, no, I got a a tip for you. And he told (laughs) me about this kind of tricky form of payday lending where payday lenders will set up on 
Okay, so states have usury laws. You can't issue loans that charge more than a certain percentage. And right. in some states, payday lending is effectively illegal, like New York. And payday loans are like, you go to the store, they give you 300 bucks, and you have to pay back, you know, 350 in two weeks or something like that. And the effective interest rate is like hundreds of times more than a credit card. It's more than mafia loan sharks ever charged. Yeah. So it's and illegal I in just, a lot of let states. Let me just say this one thing, too, like what Elizabeth Warren was talking about the other day, because this is some of the rules that the CFPB was trying to impose, which is why there's a Supreme Court case. Part of the scam here is it's called a payday loan because – it's like getting a, you know, you're supposed to get paid on Friday and you need, you need to, you know, buy food or pay the bills or pay for something. So you go in like on the Monday and they give you the loan and come Friday, you're supposed to pay it back, um, you know, really high interest, but typically you can't because you have other bills. And then the thing you end up owing like, oh, you know, it could even be like 10 times that amount because you keep rolling it over and rolling it over. And it's just like a total trap. Okay. Anyway, so continue. So in the states where payday lending is illegal, there's still demand for payday loans. Like this product sure. may be horrible for people, but a lot of people are broke and will take payday loans if they're available. So right. if you're able to offer payday loans in New York, you can make big money. And the problem is that it's illegal. So the loophole that payday lenders found was, let's do it on the internet. And at first they would say, some of them tried to say, okay, my website's in Belize. So I'm, I'm marketing to New York residents. You can't stop me. I'm in Belize. That, uh, for various reasons, didn't, didn't hold up that well. And then they switched to, we are on tribal land. This is a oh Native gosh. American tribe. And we right. are um, we, we're a sovereign state. We don't have to follow New York state law. We're just running a website on a reservation. and But the tricky thing was that, in general, there was usually some tricky dude who was not affiliated with the tribe who had actually hired the tribe to front for him and made most of the money. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, for a while, I, I, spent, I spent like a couple of years where that was my main subject, and I was investigating these semi-legal payday loan operations that took advantage of these loopholes. And I was trying to expose their real owners and showing that the tribe was just a front or the offshore shell company was, was just a front. Incredible work. I mean, that's amazing um, because it's one thing to kind of know what's going on, but it's a, it, to do the kind of deep investigation and follow the paper trail, not just the people is amazing. Um, so thank you for that work. I want to turn to this book because it's so, it's just so damn good um, on so many levels because it's interesting. You can't put it down. You you have done what I think no one else has done in terms of crypto books. And I've read many books and um, and I've paid attention to this topic. And so I commend you. And I want to start though, sort of like how, I think it's really funny, um, your own story about how you got involved in this uh, back in January, 2021 with your friend, Jay. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So you might think, all right, here's a reporter who writes about shady financial stuff. Crypto is perfect for him. And in fact, a lot of people would say that to me, but I didn't really want to write about crypto. I felt like there was no big secret to expose that so much of crypto just seemed like it was some dude saying, buy my coin. It's the future of finance. It's so great. And then it would go up and everybody would make money and it just didn't seem like uh, I write in the book that it sending an investigative reporter to look into a crypto company seemed like sending Sam Sifton, the snooty restaurant reviewer, to go check out, you know, the new Taco Bell in Union Square. Like, it's overkill. We don't need to. But, um, but then, yes, Jay, a friend of mine from high school, 
a very dear friend who's like a smart and funny guy. We used to write a humor to call him together back in high school. And we're, we're still on a group chat. And he started texting us about something he called doggy coin. And I knew enough about crypto to know that this was uh, <laughs> Dogecoin. Yeah, yeah, this is Dogecoin. And so I said, well, excuse me, sir. This is Dogecoin and it's stupid. And we, I, we will not be buying any Dogecoin. I don't think you should either. But he kept giving us uh, uh, reasons why we might want to buy it. And it wasn't that Jay thought that, that it wasn't that Jay believed some lies about Dogecoin. He knew it was just sort of a silly joke and that it didn't do anything. I mean, it's just a currency that's like a, I mean, it's a picture of a dog on a coin and you can go buy it on, you know, Robin hood or Coinbase. And you can say, mm-hmm. Hey, I own a thousand Doge coins or a million Doge coins. But there's no reason for them to have any value. I mean, they don't do anything. So let's just stop. Let me just just back up there for one second. So let's say, you know, like any other asset, you know, because, you know, we we could call it an asset instead of a a currency. But let's say you bought it. If it did go up in price, could you somehow sell it in such a way to get your money out? Sure. Yeah. Um, And what Jay believed was that he believed that other people would think that this do- doggy coin was silly and that it, they would buy it and it would go up. And he was saying, okay. hey, I could see people chatting about it on Reddit. I think it's going to go more, more mainstream. I think that I, that this is, this is the time to buy. We're early. And now me, being having spent my career investigating pump and dump schemes, I'm saying there may not be some, you know, mastermind pulling the strings, but this is like I've seen this, I've seen scams before. Don't buy it. Everybody thinks they're the one who's early, but by the time you get in on it, you're usually late and you're likely to lose money because it's, it's a zero sum game. If for someone, if if you make money by selling Dogecoin once it goes up, that the next person has to lose money. We can't just all get rich from Dogecoin going up. It depends on someone else coming in and paying real money for Dogecoin at a at a higher price. And let me just add one other thing, though. The other theory is, oh, it's just like money, and it's just much more easy to buy things with it um, somehow. But it, transaction, it doesn't actually turn out that way, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, with Dogecoin, nobody's even pretending. No one was. You know? No one was selling. No one. You couldn't like go into the grocery store. Well, you couldn't go on Silk Road and use Dogecoin to buy drugs. That's only Bitcoin, right? I mean, I mean, I didn't do that, but in, it wasn't even used. Yeah, how, to buy. how do you know about that secret? Have you been uh, yeah, ordering right, some right, stuff right. off the dark web? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you know that got shut down, but anyhow. Um. So but the thing was, Jay was right. Dogecoin did go up, and he made enough money to go to Disney, and he sent photos from his trip to the group chat and said, oh. <laughs> I am freaking Nostradamus. You know, if you had followed my advice, you you could have $10,000 right now. And well, he also had taxes to pay on that, which I hope he paid, but okay. I'm sure, I'm sure he did. And so I am just thinking to myself, like, I don't know, it just, it stuck with me. I was just, I was kind of annoyed. I was a little I bit jealous. I would be jealous. super annoyed and, and, a, and a little bit jealous. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And but mostly I, it wasn't so much about the money or Disney. It was more just like I like to be right. I think I'm the one who knows about financial stuff. And here I was, you know, my prediction was wrong. He was the one who made money. It's, in some ways, it's kind of hard to argue with the results, right? But that wasn't going to stop me. And so I was kind of primed to thinking, I want to know more about all this crypto stuff. How does this work? Why is this happening? It seems like it's not following the rules of the financial world as I know them because it wasn't just Dogecoin. There was like Ethereum, Cardano, Polygon, like smooth love potions. That's a real one. They're all going up and up and up. And I don't know what any of them are good for. And I know people are making real money off them. And so that's what sort of got me over my general disinterest in crypto and made me think, you know what, maybe I should 
investigate this world. And it's funny, though, because you weren't like, in other words, but your thesis isn't necessarily wrong, though you became interested in it. And you said a few minutes ago something about, you know, you don't, you know, having an investigative journalist investigate crypto would be having some fancy restaurant reviewer go to Taco Bell. But you may remember one of the best of all time restaurant reviews dates back to 2012. Do you know Pete Wells? Are you aware of the review I'm talking about? Pete Wells. Are you talking about the Guy Fieri review? I am indeed talking about the Guy Fieri review, including (laughs) the piece about the donkey sauce. It is legend. Am I right? Oh, yeah. I actually, I love a mean review. And I went to that restaurant afterwards to see if it was as bad as he said. And it was. And? Yeah, it's terrible. It's garbage. And I like Guy Fieri as like a person... And uh, but he he didn't do a good job at this restaurant. Um, so and it went out of business. Yeah, yeah. no, it's clearly my, it's I was, my dream. Yeah. So so in other words, I mean, I hear you, but I get I get your idea. You may think it was overkill, but at this point, you became interested because this is like the ostrich plume uh, bubble or the Dutch tulip bubble, you know. And here you are, and there's so many different flavors of it, and it was still going strong. It hadn't crashed, so you're like, what oh, the heck? Yeah, we're still. This is like we're heading towards the peak. The peak was, in right. fact, November 2021. And so mm-hmm. around the summer of 2021, I went to my first cryptocurrency conference and it was called uh, Bitcoin Miami or something like that. And it was one of the first conferences of any type since the COVID restrictions had lifted. So people were really hyped up for it. Thousands, maybe 10,000 people descended on Miami. And I decided to fly in and like see what it was all about. And even though I had this low opinion of crypto, there's also this, I mean, I was open to the idea that there could be something that I didn't know about. Maybe there's something there. And then also the crypto industry is great at creating this. uh, They're great at PR. And so you always hear these headlines that are like, JP Morgan conducts blockchain experiment or... Visa to test Solana for a settlement layer. So I had in in my head this sort of loose idea, sort of like you were getting at with Bitcoin, that at this conference, I would hear about real world uses for cryptocurrency and that I'd meet people who are kind of mainstream, kind of, and they'd be talking about how their coins were going to somehow change the world of finance, cut out middlemen, make international payments cheaper and faster, um, things like that. But surely by then, I mean, I think by then we all knew that it was very, it didn't make a, it was going a heck of a lot slower than like even something like ACH payments where the, anyway, but yes, but I hear what you're saying. You're wondering yeah. what is this intersection with the you know so-called real banking system? I was actually worried about that happening, but yeah, you're, so you go yeah. there, which sounds like a, the Disney world of conferences. Yes. So, right. Jay got to go to Disney, but I got to go to <laughs> Bitcoin Miami. And once I started meeting these guys, I realized, oh, this is not as bad as I thought. It's way worse. Like each person, (laughs) uh, the the people on stage, they're talking about Bitcoin like it was a cult. There was um, this, first of all, everyone in Bitcoin's got a podcast, but this one podcaster was really, (laughs) really hyped up. Uh, This was like the laser eyes era when people were putting laser eyes on their Twitter profile to signify Uh that Bitcoin was going to go to Um, Uh $100,000. I mean, people were, at that point, they were mad at Elon Musk. He had done something anti-Bitcoin. Their opinion of Elon Musk changes quite rapidly. But then he got the whole crowd going in this chant of, F Elon, F Elon. Um, And the people, you know, rip up paper money because fiat currency is trash. There was a... An economist. So let us back up. So like yeah. you and I, when we use the words fiat currency, we're talking about paper dollars issued by a sovereign like the U.S., uh, you know, the U.S. government issues um, or, you know, the so-called Federal Reserve notes, which is our green money. And they call it fiat currency because it's just backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government as opposed to any goal. Did I get that right? Yes. And it's like <laughs> this is such like an outdated idea. 
the the we had so many financial crises when we were on the gold standard um there just is not enough you need to be able to the idea of the central bank controlling the money supply is like a proven good thing it's not some sort yeah, of conspiracy yeah. theory um and by but, the way privately issued money isn't that just like back like to the wildcat notes i mean i just watching this stuff happen with these folks who have no context for history but anyhow it's super fun you go to this yeah. conference one of the first guys i meet is alex mashinsky who runs this place called celsius network and he tells me it's sort of <laughs> he's like it's not a bank but like basically it is a bank and if you send your crypto to him they pay interest rates as high as 18 percent and I say to him, I mean, interest rates at that time were like 0% in general. Other banks couldn't pay anything. They only paid, you know, That sounds like an unregulated security, though. You're sending this to him and he's guaranteeing you this kind of payment. And what was he doing with it? Borrowing against the crypto or what was he doing with them? Yeah, I mean, he had this, he, his explanation of what he was doing with it didn't really make any sense. And he just seemed like a total huckster. And I was just sort of being polite hearing his pitch. And I asked him, I'm thinking to myself, this is the worst business I've ever heard. But I asked him, so how much, what, what are your assets under management? And he's like, oh, $20 billion. And I think, oh my God. What? Yeah. What? Oh my, I'm like, am I sitting here with the next Bernie Madoff? Like the thought crossed my mind. And he, so, but he says to me in this great, this quote that I really love, he says, um, He's trying to say that banks are the scammers and that they could pay a higher interest rates, but they choose to just take the profits for themselves because they're greedy. And so he's um, like, so what does he not understand? Like what? I mean, what? That, how can that, you pay out? How can you pay out to depositors more than you're bringing in on the asset side of your balance sheet? How does that make any sense? Oh, I mean, they're bringing in a lot of secret stuff that because they're so greedy. And so he said to me, S somebody's lying. Either, oh, right. either JP Morgan's lying or I'm lying. And spoiler alert, he was lying. He got arrested for fraud like uh, a month or two ago. And your question of like, how is he making money to cover those interest rates is a good one. He was not. The whole thing didn't really make any sense, just like I thought. Um, but so at that time, though, I'd, I was like, I need to I put him in my notebook. Like, I better investigate this guy. Then I had a meeting with this uh 29 year old who had this big mess of curly hair he was wearing <laughs> khaki shorts a t-shirt he couldn't stop tapping his leg like he's tapping his leg like crazy and he was there to he just seemed like this you know nerdy college kid but he was there yeah, he has, you know that description does not sound familiar at all let's move yeah. on no i'm kidding um, <laughs> <laughs> so he was there to rename the miami heat arena after his crypto exchange, FTX. Uh, yeah, it's Sam, it's Sam Bankman Fried. And at that time, he was not quite so famous. He hadn't been profiled outside of, he'd made the Forbes billionaires list maybe, but he hadn't been in the New York Times or other, he just, he wasn't a household name. And so uh -huh. he told me his story about how he started this crypto hedge fund and discovered this, crazy Bitcoin trade and how I was especially interested by his motivation because he told me uh, at this point, this, this guy sitting in front of me really doesn't look like much, but he's worth like $20 billion. And he's telling me that when he was a teenager, he had been searching for some way to do good stuff for the world. And he'd been at MIT and he had been, you know, handing out pamphlets for like a PETA or something like that. And then he met a philosopher who told him, hey, you're pretty smart. You could probably make a lot of money. Anybody can hand out pamphlets. Why don't you, instead of working for like a good cause, why don't you just try to get rich and give that money away? And we could hire, you know, a thousand people to give out pamphlets with your money. And so Sam, he told me, like, he heard this pitch when he was a teenager. He said, sure, that sounds cool. And then here he was. It wasn't even 10 years later. He's one of the richest guys in the world. 
Um, and so, so he's kind of pitching himself a little bit with this this effective altruism that he is maybe a kind of Robin Hood where he can trade with the rich, get money out of them, and then give it to all these do-gooder causes like people for the ethical treatment of animals. That's the story. More or less, yeah. And I thought, I mean, I bet a lot of people who want to get rich, but none who set out to do it for such a strange reason. So right. I only had a, he, he was in town from Hong Kong for this to celebrate the stadium renaming. And I had this, I only had like a quick meeting with him, but that oh, was so another one. so he was one. in Hong Kong. That's before he moved to the, bah- to the Bahamas. Okay, got you. Yeah. Yep. So I, I mean, I met a lot of other crazy people and then I get back to New York. I'm telling my editor and I'm just like, I was wrong about this crypto stuff. There's so much to investigate. We could be like, we will not manage to investigate all of these people before this bubble pops. Like, it's just like a all you can eat buffet of potential investigative stories. So what I want to do before we would circle back to Sam Bankman fried is um, because we can't do everything. um, But like, I I want to mention all these characters I love and then ask you about tether and and stable coin um, generally. Um, So you've got some people in here that are amazing, like the plastic surgeon. Uh, I mean, I, I, I can never resist an opportunity to read more about Heather Morgan, a.k.a. RazzleCon. I did watch that cringy. I did show my students when I was teaching. When it came out, when I was teaching white collar crime, I did show my students that whole video of her being RazzleCon. And it was like the highlight of the class that semester. Um, and then there's also your like ape coin or something or your ape. Um, no, your, N- your NFT. All that stuff is so cool. Um, I, I can't praise you enough, but be, I, but I want to be a little bit nerdy here because one of the most significant contributions that you make, I think, in this book is, um, is you know, not just these interesting stories of these, you know, shady characters, because kind of anyone, not and I won't say anyone, but like they kind of write them, some of this stuff can write itself. It's that you were there at the right place at the right time, but that you understood this this one of these pieces of it, which is the tether stable coin piece of it. Can you talk? And I guess that does get into the plastic surgeon guy. Can I found I found this absolutely mind blowing as someone who worked in finance. Um, and um, can you talk about? Um, I guess your main to simplify it first, maybe the main sort of thesis you have around like what tether slash stable coin is supposed to do and what it was really doing and how that is kind of at the heart of a lot of the fraud inside of the crypto world. Does that make sense? Sure. So when I was on this trip to Miami, I was there on assignment for Business Week. And my editor had said, not just go look into crypto and find whatever story you can. He was interested in stable coins. And the biggest one at the time was called Tether. And it's called a stable coin because the value is supposed to stay at a dollar. And it's supposed to stay at a dollar because each coin is redeemable for one real dollar. So it's kind of a simple business. You give Tether the company 100 real dollars. Tether, the company, puts those 100 real dollars in the bank somewhere. And they give you 100 Tether tokens, which you can then go use to You could take them to FTX and gamble on crypto there with your tethers. So, and let me just stop here and and just just make an analogy to the regulated system. Having these sort of, you know, stable coin things that you could buy, you know, go out, you know, you have your fiat money, you get to buy them, and then you put them inside of one of these crypto exchanges or other accounts that you have. It's a way to to keep all of this sort of coins inside of the system where people can sort of like, if you want to sell your Bitcoin because you felt like it went high, you can, you can convert your Bitcoin into these stable coins and then use the stable coins to buy other things. So it, it, in some ways it makes the system work so that people aren't constantly like running 
from crypto and trying to redeem out into cash because there's not enough cash backing all this stuff. And it's also analogous to like, if anyone has like, for example, I used to work at Fidelity Investments and I have a um, IRA that own, inside of my IRA, I own all these um, mutual funds. If I want to sell a mutual fund, it gets sold, but I don't cash out. I, get, I can convert it into a money market fund, let's say. And then that's supposed to be stable to keep a stable value. And then I can just hold it there and then use that to invest. That way you're not having to constantly exit into the banking system. So, th- so having a, having a sort of quote, you know, stable coin or currency is vital to the system. Okay. Sorry yeah. for my editorializing. And no, no. So, well, especially in the early years of crypto, a lot of banks didn't want to have anything to do with crypto companies. So right. there were crypto exchanges that were not able to accept your regular dollars as deposits. So these exchanges would say, hey, if you want to trade here, you need to go first, get some tethers, bring those here, because that's part of crypto world. The regulators aren't really paying that much attention to it. We we, we don't have to deal with any banks. Just it's like, like chips uh, in a casino. You got to bring your chips yeah, to the chip. go get. The, <laughs> it's like all the casinos use the same cashier and they were just like, go yep. to tether, get your chips and then come here and gamble. So, yep. At the time I started looking into it, Tether had gotten so big that it there were 50 billion Tethers floating around. And it was sort of like the central bank of crypto. Everyone agreed it was central to the whole crypto economy. But that meant that Tether was supposed to have 50 billion real dollars in a bank somewhere. somewhere. And they weren't saying right. where. And by the way, who who owned, like the person who founded crypto, Crypto is that crazy actor bro who now owns like half of old San Juan. Um, but now who is owning, who owns, who owns Tether now or then when you're writing about it? Yeah. So I just start Googling it yeah, and like yeah. one thing after one weird thing after another comes up. And the, one of the things is that the CEO is a Dutch guy who's never People in crypto are huge self-promoters usually. They go to these conferences and talk about how great their coin is. It's basically the main activity in crypto. Um, (laughs) And Oh, my God. uh, This guy is never seen. Uh, (laughs) People were speculating he might not really exist because he was so – there was so little about him online. And then asking around, I heard that the the real boss at Tether was a CFO, Giancarlo DiVicini, a former plastic surgeon from Milan. And I um I find he had I find this very evocative photo of him that he had posed for for an art show when he was younger, where he's shaved half his face and he's staring in the mirror. And there's a little interview with him that was posted with it, and he's like where he says, I just had to leave plastic surgery because I realized that my whole life had been a scam and you know i was uh i couldn't you know do another boob job it was just um <laughs> this is my life was a fraud and then i looking into him more he got into sort of the low end of the electronics business he had been sued by or he'd been a, a fined in italy for selling counterfeit microsoft software although he said that was a inadvertent but um Yeah, there's just red flag after red flag. The company, you can't even tell where it is. They won't say where the money is. The company had said at one point that it was regulated by the British Virgin Islands, or they sort of hinted at that. But then I... By BVI, yeah. Yeah, I called the regulator. They're like, no. Um, And yeah, one of the founders of Tether, although he was no longer involved, was Brock Pierce, (laughs) who has the, the real estate holdings... In the Bahamas, and he no John doesn't he have them in Puerto Rico. I'm sorry, in Puerto Rico. Thought, yeah. Yes, in Puerto yeah, Rico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. he was a successful child actor who <laughs> played. He was in the the Mighty Ducks, and he he portrayed Gordon Bombay in the flashback where he missed the penalty shot. And I'm just thinking to myself, wait, these are the this is the central bank of crypto. Like it's all based on this and. It was, this wasn't like some sideshow. Around that time, Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, 
had called a meeting of all the top financial regulators in the United States. And they she ha- had them all come to the Treasury Department to talk about, you know, Giancarlo and Brock's coin. Be like, what do they have the 50 billion? Could this like crash the crypto world if if they didn't? Could that spill over right, into the real financial system? Point. I loved your point on this, which is like if the money isn't like, you know, you know, cash in some bank account, what if they've invested in some stocks or bonds that they're going to have to quickly liquidate if people pull their money. You know, there was a lot of, there. Was, that's a really legitimate question. And I, I was shocked when I read that in your book that she was she was looking into that. Um, so this is a great way to pivot to Sam Bankman Free because there's a connection. Can you can you make the connection? Can you tether us to um, <laughs> the connection between, between Tether and FTX? Uh, because I'd love to get to him and then before we close out, talk about what you think of the trial, which is you know literally going on as we're speaking. So Tether became the thread that I followed through this whole crypto world because everybody uses it. And it became like the book follows me trying to solve this mystery and figure out what's up with Tether and where is this $50 billion. And just like, we won't go there, but it takes me to some weird places like Cambodia, where I'm looking into whether Tether is being used to facilitate human trafficking. Uh, But it also took me to the Bahamas because... Sam Bankman frieds company, FTX, was one of the biggest users of Tether. There's one of the nice things about crypto is there are these blockchain detectives who a lot of even though crypto accounts are anonymous, like each person's address is like a string of random numbers and isn't tied to their identity. There are people who've made it their business to figure out whose address is whose. And the, one of these detectives had figured out that um, FTX had bought something like $30 billion of Tether. So I was like, all right, if anybody knows what's up with Tether, because I wasn't, I was hitting a lot of dead ends, maybe maybe Sam Bakeman fried does. I mean, he clearly trusted enough to buy $30 billion worth or, well, or maybe he didn't. I mean, maybe there's some. They got some sort of weird scheme going on. So right. I pitched um, Sam on me writing a profile of him for Bloomberg, and in February 2022, right after FTX aired this Larry David commercial at the Super Bowl, um, one of my fa- my possibly my favorite comedian, shilling crypto for him. Um, I flew down to the Bahamas to meet Sam. And I had told his people the way that I work, I'm going to need to spend a couple days with him. I want to see him just doing what he does, observe him running the company um, so I can write about him as he is. And most corporate executives would never go for that. They'd be like, you get 30 minutes, and I'm just going to read some bullet points that I've read eight times before. So, and my lawyer and PR person will be sitting next to me. <laughs> yeah. But Sam totally acted like he had nothing to hide. I mean, he uh, he was like, sure, pull up a chair. And I'm sitting there at his desk. He's answering emails from fellow billionaires. Bank CEOs are pinging him, being like, I've flown to the Bahamas. Can I get five minutes with you? Oh, and he's like, I am meh. And um, <laughs> he's doing he's doing uh, other interviews, like he's doing an interview with NPR. I'm sitting there observing him. He's playing video games while he does the other interview, even though he knows I'm going to write about it. Um, he's just like the weirdest uh, executive that 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 I've ever met. Um, and what I talked to him about was. I, I mean, I was open with him that I was kind of skeptical about cryptocurrency. And he had a, this clever way of presenting himself as kind of a fellow skeptic. And even though he looked like a kid, he acted like he was kind of the grown up in the room. Now, he was a Wall Street guy. He'd worked at a respected trading firm on Wall Street. 
And he acted like he knew that crypto, a lot of it was probably scams, but that his exchange FTX was here to stay. And he wasn't making crazy bets on Dogecoin. He was just setting up the casino. And if look, if people wanted to gamble on crypto, who was he to stop them? They could come to his casino and he'd earn, you know, a little rake on every trade. And that was going to make mm-hmm. him rich. And he was going to give all that money away to, to charity. And that was sort of the, the story I told, he told. And I had no suspicion that, in fact, he was stealing all the money out of the back of the casino and taking it to <laughs> other crypto casinos where he was betting it on Dogecoin and stuff like that. And so that brings us to the trial. Have you either been in court to watch it or followed any of the reporters who are allowed to uh, bring their phones in and, and tweet about it? Yes, I've um, been, I was not there today, but have been at the courthouse most days. The And I mean, it looked bad for Sam going into this trial. His top lieutenants, his best friends have turned on him And they've all, even before the trial started, they had all pleaded guilty. And they'd said in their, when it came time for them to make their court appearance and plead guilty, they'd said basically, one after the next, I committed fraud. I knew it was wrong. I did it with Sam. He also knew it was wrong. We did it on purpose. And so, and these people are, are testifying against him now. And seeing it, live is actually even more powerful because these people are right there in front of you. They seem like pretty normal, trustworthy people. The details of the case are kind of confusing, I imagine, for many members of the jury. And some of them seem kind of bored of it. I've seen one person in particular keeps falling asleep. Um, but are you kidding me? If, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, but if they come to for a minute, what they see is like, some nice guy or girl on on the stand saying, yes, I feel really bad. I did like, a, I was part of this horrible fraud. And like, yes, we did it. And explaining in great detail how they committed this fraud with the guy over there with the curly hair. Um, so the defense hasn't really been able to present much of a case. I mean, they're going to have their turn well, next. Well, they haven't. They're, um, all they're doing is cross-examining. How are they doing? How do you feel like they're doing on cross-exam or the judges feeling about this? Their strategy is confusing to me. They seem to be trying to bore people to death. They just have the witnesses. Oh. They just keep repeating questions, and they're having the witnesses just say things again that they already said to the prosecution. Um, to me, it doesn't seem like they've uh, raised too many doubts about these uh, cooperators' accounts. But the most dramatic witness was Caroline Ellison, who's... The uh, uh, girlfriend who ran the hedge fund Almeida uh, research? Yes, and... Why was she the most interesting? So towards the end of my book, I right out before the cops get to the Bahamas to arrest Sam, I fly down there. And I spend a day with him talking about what had happened and his version of the story. And it was really wild. I was sitting there in his, you know, $30 million penthouse. And he was acting like, you know, okay. I feel like he lived his life sort of like it was a video game. And he would take these crazy risks, you know? Exactly. And But that means like in a video game, if you screw up, you just start again at the beginning of the level, you know? And so I'm in this penthouse with him. It was like, to me, it's very depressing because I'm like, you will not be starting. This is game over. Like, you are (laughs) going to get charged with fraud very soon. But he's acting like like he's going to save his company somehow, raise $10 billion, start everything up again. And when he's going through all these excuses about what happened and... I mean, he talked for hours and hours, but finally I was like, Sam, are you really trying? Are you telling me this? Does it all just boil down to it's my ex-girlfriend's fault? And he's like, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm like, I think it is. Um, And I don't think that's going to go over that well. 
And now we're in court, and it seems like that is his argument. And the ex-girlfriend has just been like, she's been testifying and giving, she's just been saying in this great Caroline detail. Caroline Wilson. Caroline, right. yes. And she's she yeah. said like, so Sam had tried to say it was sort of a mis- big mistake. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't know about where the money was going. I was just, you know, busy doing interviews with the reporters. But Caroline has said- And just said, to be clear, uh, I mean, the biggest, there's a lot, just to be clear, there's a lot of fraud going on. But one of the biggest problems is the fact that he had this hedge fund and he, he was the you know owner of this hedge fund. And then he also got people to, you know, borrow money to invest people's money in this hedge fund. But then he started up this crypto exchange and they were, you know, had this backdoor way to take some of the crypto customers who are gambling on that exchange, take their assets and just loan them like huge amounts of them over to the the hedge fund where they were making their own bets. And he lied about that. Like, like that's one of the big things. But then he was saying, like you're saying here, that he said, well, I kind of stepped away from the hedge fund. I'm like, Caroline run anything. I had no idea she was doing this. Yes. Right. And, and now Caroline has said, no, like I gave him regular reports on what we were doing. He told me what to do. Um, and now she said, hey, Sam told me, we have to use Signal for chats and have our messages auto delete. So they don't have the Signal chats, but they have Google Docs. And there's the, some where Caroline is showing Sam financial reports that make clear what's going on. And they, some of them even have comments from him on the Google Doc. So it's going to be pretty hard for him to keep up this argument that he just had no idea. I also thought. Um and this is just a kind of a random thing, but is it true that she really said under oath that Sam said he grew his hair out and made it even crazier because it, he got he made more money when people thought he was sort of eccentric? Yes, he said that starting from his first job at the Wall Street trading firm. He thinks he got bigger bonuses because of his crazy hair. And so when he went to FTX, he he kept that up. And I also heard like there's so much mythology. Like he claimed, you know, people always say he slept in a beanbag chair, but then you come to find out, well, like only on occasion. Like he really well, was cultivating uh, this image of boy genius who can't be bothered with. Um, it, you know, it reminds me of who was that? Is it Sam Giganti? The, you know, the guy who tried to claim he was um, out of it, the mob guy, because he walked around in a bathrobe. I wonder whether Sam kind of wanted to seem like he was a space cadet, couldn't follow the details, didn't have a mind for that so as to have some sort of plausible deniability later, or whether more likely he actually kind of is an arrogant young guy who didn't want to deal with details or somewhere in between. What's your what's your thought on that? I think that his persona was kind of genuine and that he... Yeah, okay, me too. He re- but he realized it was working for him. Like he was smart enough ah, to realize, yeah. hey, if people, I, I mean, he, I've spoken to people who worked with him all through the years. He really did sleep on the beanbag a lot, but less as time okay. went on. Um, and, uh-huh. but he realized, hey, people think it's really cool that I sleep on this beanbag. It makes me seem not like other billionaires. It's going to help me get more PR. It impresses venture capitalists. And I, I, there was one former employee who said that they'd make sure to bring the venture capitalists around when Sam was sleeping on the beanbag. Um, And while I was there in the Bahamas, I was like, I'll be damned if I leave this island without seeing him sleep on this beanbag. So I I spent a whole day at the office and I was like, uh, and sure enough, one afternoon, he just passed out on that beanbag. And he, he came to, but... I think a lot of listeners are going to be like, he just did that for Zeke. It's all Zeke was tricked. Um, but I mean, it was a long nap on that beanbag and he woke up for a minute <laughs> and just, uh, he just shoved some nutter butters in his mouth and like made a huge mess of the nutter butters and then went back to sleep on the beanbag. Like, I really think he did not care that I was there and this nap was not for my benefit, but uh, maybe, maybe I, I was had in more important ways than than this fake uh, beanbag nap, if indeed it was fake. That is an amazing story. And I need to, right before we say goodbye, ask you, is there something I forgot to ask you uh, that you wanted to talk about? 
you know, these two years in the crypto world were some of like the, you know, craziest times of my life. And uh, so there were so there are so many things that we didn't talk about. But uh, I don't even know. I don't even know where to go. Um, but I, well, I, I will just say, since I know your listeners may have heard an interview with fellow crypto book author uh, Michael Lewis, that you know, as a first time author, I, while I was working on this book, in fact, during that trip to the Bahamas, Sam was so trans. He had let me see everything so I could see on his calendar that he had just spent two days with Michael Lewis in Los Angeles. And of course I'm like, Oh man, that's kind of a drag. Like here I am thinking I'm, uh, could take my time writing my crypto book. And one of the most famous authors in the world might be working on one right now. Um, but I, I was like, you know what, whatever, just write your book, do it how you think is best. Do what you th- investigate the things that you want to find out about and that you think the reader will want to hear about. And when I was done with it, I was like, you know what? I'm really proud of how this came out. I think it's like a super exciting story. And I'm not even worried about what his book is like. What I'm worried about is where am I going to find like another crazy world like this to write a second book? Because it was so exciting and fun to write this one. You know what? There's always, there's going to be, what I believe is something will bite you again. Uh, You know, maybe not as crazy, but crazy in its own way. Well, yeah, I'm hoping to see Jay tonight. So I'll be sure to ask him if he has any, he wants to tease me about anything. If he's got any new ideas for me. Well, he definitely should be buying the drinks given that he made all that money on Dogecoin. Oh, no, it's I owe him for getting me. I got more out of this than him, for sure. I owe him. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. Well, it's been great finally meeting you and speaking with you. And congratulations on a truly tremendous book. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much for being here with us for yet another episode of Booked Up. I really enjoyed speaking with Zeke. Uh, I noticed that he had this habit of pausing and thinking before responding to my questions. That is refreshing. And what he processed and what he shared with us was really illuminating. And the book is even better. I want to read you one passage from the prologue uh, just to get whet your appetite for his storytelling chops as well as the story he tells. So this is... Um, this is a part of the, the, the prologue where he's talking about pitching uh, this book to his publisher back in November of 2021 and um, how three months later he was uh, sitting with uh, Sam Bankman fried at his office in the Bahamas. Um, and here's, he, he, let me just read that passage to you. After we'd spent a few hours together, I decided to ask Bankman fried for advice. This was half interview tactic, half genuine cry for help. I didn't expect him to tell me his whole industry was really a fraud, but I wanted to see if he might be willing to point me in the right direction. So I laid out my whole narrative dilemma. I told him my theory that the coin called Tether, the supposedly safe crypto bank that served as the backbone for a whole lot of other cryptocurrencies, could prove to be fraudulent and how that could bring down the whole industry. Bankman Fried said that I was wrong. Crypto wasn't a scam and neither was Tether, but he wasn't offended by my question. He said he totally understood my problem. Then he did something that didn't strike me as strange at the time, but knowing what I know now, I can't help but wonder if he was trying to make some kind of winking confession. Bankman Fried cut me off, nodding, as I tried to explain more. His tone turned chipper. He said, it's like the narrative would be way sexier if it was like, holy shit, this is the world's biggest Ponzi scheme, right? Right. I'll be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. 
Let us know what you think. Send an email to bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write to Booked Up at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give us a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast.